This is House Planning Help, episode 141. Hello, I'm Ben Adam Smith, and this is the podcast for you if you're interested in self build, because I'm exploring what houses we should be building in the 21st century and trying to break down the major roadblocks that may get in our way. My personal goal is still to create an energy efficient home. However, doing it before I'm 40, it's not going to happen. I turn 40, in fact, in a few days. In this session, my guest is Andrew Collinson, and we pick another profession to look at. This is in our mini series. Last time around, it was a quantity surveyor. This time we're investigating a structural engineer and what one of those might do, how you might interact with one, because Andrew is a structural engineer. So I'll fire some questions at him very, very soon. If you're a regular to the podcast, you will have heard a few land stories over the last couple of years now. (laughs) It's getting silly. And here's one. This came about just by chance, really. We were dropping in on some estate agents doing the rounds and they told us about a property that was out of our price range. Quite an interesting thought because there's a lot of competition in certain areas, isn't there? Most people have a certain amount of money and that's where you're all fighting. So if you can stick your head above there, and particularly with this, there was opportunity to make a bit of money if you could see through the construction and dividing up the land and so forth. So what they said was that there was a serial developer who was messing them around a bit and just not going as fast as they would like. And the property, I went to see it, in a beautiful village, really, really pretty. One that is not far from where I live, and yet I've never been there before. Never even, I thought I recognized the name, but that was about it. And it was a period property right in the center. So on this village green, within all the planning boundaries, Formerly, it used to be two semi-detached properties, which had at some stage been knocked through into one and kept like that. So the idea being that you would separate those back to two individual properties. This building, old building, would have needed some work. Hopefully, I could have found the right work. You know, this is in dreamland here to get that to happen, to do this really well, because I'm not a big fan of dividing things up. However, it used to be like this. So in some ways, it reverts back quite nicely. And then there's a portion of land to the side that almost looks like an infill plot where you can have a new house. And this was a village with lots of thatch roofs and so forth. And I've probably mentioned a couple of times how my wife likes thatch. I like a lot of the natural materials in inverted commas. So this could be a route to go down. However, it wasn't. (laughs) Just quickly cover the downsides as we were looking at it, trying to weigh up whether this was a good idea. The finances would be tricky. I reckon almost bringing an investor on board, I could make that happen. So I wasn't too worried there. However, it got out of hand, which I think is far more likely. I've never done anything like this before or we couldn't get permission and the market dived so we couldn't recoup the money. Those are the sort of risks that I just I have no sense of how to weigh them up. It's also a village that you would have to drive in and out of. So how sustainable is that? When I think of my current location in the middle of a town, I've mentioned this a few times, I walk backwards and forwards. We only have one car because we very rarely use the car, mainly for going to the supermarket or if I have a work job that needs driving somewhere. So that was weighing it up. And then we actually looked into the planning situation because I was getting excited. As you do, you tend to go on this roller coaster thinking this could happen. I can make this work. And then we discovered that this was a village where they were just basically saying no development whatsoever, which is perhaps why it is so pristine and oldy woldy. And I thought, oh, this would be perfect. But at the end of all of that, having thought it might happen, then it not happening. What does that mean for the serial developer? Apparently he was a specialist in old buildings, so he would have known it from that point of view. I'm imagining if he's done this multiple times, would he not run into the same difficulty and how would he get around that? Or having done it a certain amount of times before, was it some sort of calculated risk? That's what I don't know. Would I make different decisions if I was 10, 20 years down the line and had experience of doing this a few times? Just thought that was interesting. Maybe it's something that you've thought about. If uh, You certainly see developers doing it when they've got enough money to be able to put back into these projects, sometimes taking a larger building or something that you would have to have money to throw at it. Anyway, let's get on with today's podcast. And it's an interview with Andrew Collinson. I mentioned before that we're going to be exploring various different roles in this mini series. So last time round, it was quantity surveyor. This time round, we're finding out about the role of a structural engineer, which is why we get going on this. I asked Andrew to tell me a little bit about the area he works in. 
Well, I'm a structural engineer, and the basic job of a structural engineer is to make things stand up. So often we will get uh, architects' drawings, and the job of the structural engineer is to make sure the foundations are suitable, that any beams that are in there are the right size, sizing up floor timbers, roof timbers, anything like that. How do you train as a structural engineer? I did a degree course, but that was mostly theory. So the training is really on the job training with a company that does this. So that, that's how I started. And what would you say you learn as you go from project to project? Well, I, I initially started off working for a big contractor on site doing large-scale reinforced concrete work. And then I gradually moved from working on site into the design office. And having that background gives you a, a real understanding of the practicality of a design. So you have to produce a design that will work on site. And the simpler, the better, because then it's most likely to be built right. If you make something complicated, there's much more chance for, for it to be misinterpreted and got wrong. We're coming from a self-built angle here. I'm assuming not every project needs a structural engineer. No, a lot of them will need some engineering input. And this is often done through the architect. So for a number of, of projects, I don't actually get to meet the client or talk to the client because the architect will have designed the building and he knows which areas he needs engineering help. And he just comes to someone like myself to get foundation details, things like that, beam sizes. Let's talk about foundations because that's obviously quite important. So what do you do? What kind of research of those foundations to begin with? Or are you presented with lots of facts and figures and then you build on top of that? Well, to be honest, for most jobs, you know nothing about the soil. Nobody's dug in the ground and had a look. So you have to take a sort of best guess that will cover most circumstances and then cover it with notes. So you, you write down the assumptions of you assume the ground is something suitable and these foundations will work with that. And if when they start digging, they find something, the ground is very soft or they meet rock very quickly, anything that's outside those parameters, then they need to come back and ask again. Because most people don't want to go to the expense of having a site investigation. On the whole, then, are you doing the upfront work? You're hoping not to have to be called back. Uh, generally, I don't get called back. But there are cases where things haven't worked out right. Because until you dig in the ground, you might think you know what's under there, but you just don't know. There could have been an old quarry there and you've got metres of fill or the rock could outcrop, or it might have been a marsh beforehand. You just don't know. So in most cases, standard foundation solutions work, but there's always a few that don't. So maybe you could outline some of the, maybe a couple of examples of how you would go about that, some situations that you've encountered on self-builds. Well, most cases are covered by Part A of the building regulations. There's a series of grand descriptions in there. And depending on the loading on the wall coming onto the foundation, it gives you the minimum foundation width. And building regulations also stipulate how deep the foundations need to be. Now, this can be altered if you've got trees close by, for instance, and you're on clay soil. But most cases are covered by the building regulations part A. And it's a question of just reading off the tables. So most people could do that if they had an idea of what the loading coming down the wall was. Is there ever a reason that you'd go beyond that? You know, they're suggesting this minimum, but might there be a reason why you'd go beyond? 
were generally part A of the building regs is reasonably conservative. So I wouldn't normally expect to go larger than that unless it was outside the descriptions they give. So the normal case is where someone wants to do something that's smaller than the building regulations part A document, and then it might need more careful engineering. So you go into the nitty gritty of it. And for that, you would need to know what the soil conditions were. It's that thing until you dig in the ground, you don't know what's under there. So you either pay up front to get someone to come and have a look at it, or you take the risk when you dig that there might be a slight delay. So it's, it's your choice as and the builder. everything can, can be resolved, can't it? It's just yes. time, probably money. Yeah. As someone I worked with used to say, you can build the Cairngorms in Norfolk if, you, if you've got the money. So there's always a way around it. It's cost. We've talked about foundations. So what about the other parts of the buildings? It seems that we do almost need scenarios, don't we, to to be able to dig into this as I'm having this discussion. The sort of traditional build is masonry. And that's very well covered by the building regulations because that is what the vast majority of houses are built with. Timber frame is less well covered by the documents, but often that's designed by the supplier and they will have their own engineers. The more tricky ones to get past building regulations are things like straw bale, cob, and these these very unusual structural materials that have a have quite a long history, but because they're natural materials, they are not so well defined structurally what the strength of a cob wall is. We know it's a lot, but how? what number do you use for that? And for straw bale, you know, we know it works because there's lots of straw bale houses being built, but trying to convince a building control officer that it's been designed right and it's not going to fall down can sometimes be a little more challenging. As a structural engineer, do you also tend towards certain materials that, that you like or are you happy to work with cob or anything? Is, is that part of the challenge of the job? The opportunities to work with cob and straw bale and rammed earth, things like that, are very few and far between. And to build up an expertise in them takes quite a lot. There are one or two structural documents now that help with that for an engineer. But to a great extent, by the time the project comes to the engineer, things have been sorted out to a level where you don't have a lot of input. If a building's been drawn up and it's got a certain distance as masonry, the chance of persuading them to change that to be timber frame or vice versa are very small. So if you want to use an unusual material, it's good to get the engineer at least on board and talking reasonably early because I certainly like to to be involved early on if it's something unusual so that I've got more chance to research to have some input to make sure there aren't any um, real difficulties cropping up in the design but most of what I get asked to do is is masonry and steel um, steel beams but I do like where it's feasible to offer people timber green oak or or dried oak beams instead because they have a different look and also there's a lot less embedded energy within a timber beam than a steel beam. And they're not hugely bigger. Can you compare and contrast those materials that you've just mentioned, scenarios when you would use it? I'm assuming steel is always seems to be the number one thing if you've got a huge, great load. Is that right? Steel is very, very stiff. It's a very efficient material uh, from an engineering point of view. Timber being a natural material, tends to move a bit more, particularly if you use green oak 
And then you will get a lot of drying shrinkage, which adds to the look of it. Every timber beam is different. Every steel beam is pretty much identical. So if you're, if you're limited for headroom or you want to hide the beam, then steel is very good. If you're not bothered about the look of it, if you're never going to see it, people normally opt for steel because it's readily available, it's fairly inexpensive, and builders know what to do with it. Um, you, don't, you, know, you don't need someone who's, got, who's used to handling timber. But the advantages with timber are you can cut it yourself so you, you can get a piece that's slightly too big and then cut it exactly on site. Whereas steel, you normally have to get someone else to cut it for you and you've got to get it right first time. But it's not too difficult. You talked a little bit about when you become involved on a project. Where exactly is that in the process and times that it varies, times that you're brought in quite late? So maybe you could pinpoint that for us. Normally, I'm in the end of the design process for housing where all the architectural design has been sorted and they just want to make sure it stands up. On larger projects, um, housing estates, things like that, they tend to bring the engineer in a little bit earlier, but still often the scheme design's done, there isn't a lot of scope for changing things. So if you're looking to build something that's unusual, I would recommend at least having an engineer who's got a like a watching brief just just to look at the designs early on and make sure that there's nothing that's likely to cause difficulties later because difficulties often translates into extra cost. So not necessarily doing the actual calculations early on, but just giving some advice. And will you suggest certain things? So you look through the design and do some calculations and then say, actually, you'd be better having this here is that the the sort of way it works yes you you can say this will give a lot of difficulty if we can just move that wall across a bit do this do that then it doesn't materially change the room or or the look of the house but it makes the engineering side so much easier and simplicity is what we're after so that's it really I've always heard the reverse sometimes that you've got to be careful when you deal with engineers because they'll, they'll create something amazing. But that's, that's encouraging to hear this simplicity. And not, maybe not everyone has the same view as me, but I just like a really simple answer where it's possible. So some people maybe like to, like to over-engineer things and make, you know, increase their job. But um, I, I like to keep things simple. We've talked about self-builders perhaps not even coming into contact if they're dealing with an architect, but if we are, have you got examples of where you have dealt directly with the self-builders? I'm on a project at the moment where the client has, he's employed architects, but he's been let down by his first engineer of choice. So he's come to me, the scheme is basically done, but there's still some scope because the client is very hands-on and has done a lot of research into what he wants to do and therefore is is very open to uh, to making changes and it's very helpful to be able to talk to a client who understands and does some research because it can be quite difficult where you're you're trying to talk about technical details and the client doesn't really understand it's very refreshing to find someone who you can you can talk through a difficult bit of the scheme and how it could be made better and they understand and are able to make that decision as to whether to change something or not now, it can be a fine difference between that and an interfering client who keeps changing things because when you're trying to move things along quickly, 
change needs to be managed as a process. There's nothing racks up bills more quickly than constant changes by the client because it can often involve going right back to square one and redoing a whole load of stuff, which isn't readily apparent to someone who doesn't understand. So it is important to manage changes in the right way as a client, which doesn't mean to say that you can't change things, but you need to understand there may well be consequences. And change them at the beginning rather than at the end, if possible. (laughs) Change them at the beginning, yes. Don't change them. Certainly once you've got bricks and mortar or or timber frame going up, changes then need to be very carefully managed. What's the difference between a good structural engineer and a bad one? I suppose a bad one's one who doesn't get on with the work at all and gives you an over-engineered solution but most of all causes delays, I would say. Now, certainly around here, there don't seem to be enough engineers to cope with all the work. So inevitably, some jobs don't get done very quickly. Where do we go then to find a structural engineer and to know that they're one of these good ones or one of these qualified ones? I think try and get a recommendation from someone. It's incredibly difficult for someone without the knowledge to know really whether whether it's a good design or not and ask around try and find people who have used an engineer were they happy with them did they produce things to a reasonable time scale and you know was the cost reasonable because costs can vary hugely um, between engineers so Personal recommendation, I think, is really the way to go. Yeah, on cost then, why do some charge more than others? I suppose this is the same in every industry, but why in in your industry? Some of it's supply and demand. Sometimes you can get a really cheap price because someone completely underestimates the amount of work. And sometimes they overcharge because maybe they don't like the look of your job and they're thinking, well... If I'm going to have to do this, then I want paying reasonably for it. I think there's a lot of putting your finger in the air and just seeing what the price feels like rather than sitting down and working out the hours that you're going to spend and then costing it out that way. Um, So I think a lot of people price things on the feel of a job. Does it feel like a £200 job, a £2,000 job? Um, yeah. Maybe take us through a typical either day or week. What are some of the things that you're actually doing when you work? I do a reasonable number of visits to properties, either when people are purchasing them and there are faults, typically cracking is, is the, the classic one, or going to have a look where people want to take walls out. But other than that, I generally spend most of my time in the office doing work by email, working on drawings, producing calculations. And it's probably over three quarters of the time is, is in the office and maybe up to a quarter is, is out doing surveys and looking at properties. and. The smaller jobs typically don't require any drawing, whereas the larger jobs, I find more and more people want a drawing of what's required. It's so varied, really. There isn't a typical day. Um, Do you use any particular software, or what are we talking about when you say drawings? Well, I use a program called AutoCAD for doing my drawings because it's It's a program I've used for many years, so I'm very comfortable with it. And it does far more than I'll ever, ever need to. And I think I'm unusual in that I do most of my calculations by hand, written on paper and not using computer software. I I use it where I need to, where things are much more complicated, but for typical house 
I will produce handwritten paper calculations because I find they're as quick and you use a lot less paper. As we get towards the end of the interview, perhaps we could turn our attention to things that might not have gone so well. Are there scenarios or things that might have been avoided if a structural engineer had been involved or have you got any stories? You probably know what I'm talking about. Yes, I've been called out recently where a house that was built on uh, fairly steep ground, the retaining walls had moved quite, let's say, significantly. And it was evident that they'd not really been designed properly. And sometimes a confident builder will, will do something that he's seen before that was appropriate for one site, but it really wasn't appropriate here. So the retaining wall, which was holding up the driveway at the side of the house, did need to be taken down and rebuilt uh, correctly. And other times, I sometimes get called in where foundations, once they've started digging, aren't what everyone assumed. And you need to go out there quickly and have a look because people are standing, waiting. The other one is drainage on larger projects can always be a bit tricky putting in all the drain runs, particularly where the external levels haven't been worked out fully when you're trying to design the drain run. Also, I've been called out to jobs where beams have not been put in right and need to be sorted out and one or two slightly scary situations um collapsed yes. buildings is that oh uh, not yeah. not quite that far yet things like um cars parked incorrectly let's say um i've been asked to look at some of those yeah just things where people thought they could do something but it turns out they couldn't but nothing that needed complete demolition and rebuilding yet um, finally, maybe just if you can think of any good tips for self-builders, people going into this, it can be absolutely anything. I would say in terms of choosing an engineer, speak to a few and see how they feel on the phone. Do they feel a bit standoffish? Are they someone you could have a discussion with? Are, are they the sort of person that you would want working for you or not? Because sometimes if people don't speak to you nicely on the phone the first time, how are they going to talk to you later on? So go with your gut feel about someone. Andrew, thank you very much. Thank you. Head online to take a look at the show notes for this session today at houseplanninghelp.com slash 141. You can review the key points there. Also, if you have a comment that you'd like to make or you want to ask a question, just scroll down to the bottom of the show notes. Once again, at houseplanninghelp.com slash 141. Let's finish up with a hub update. The quick recap remind you of what this is all about. This is our members only area, and it's something that I'm looking to build out in the next few days, weeks, months and years. I think it will always be something that can be honed and can be made better. At the moment, it splits up like this. I'm not saying it's going to be like this forever, but at the moment, we've got the case studies. We're using all the skills that we have at Regen Media to try and produce a whole case study from start to finish when it's just land to digging down into the foundations and digging the basement and then building up again. So that's the case study side that we divide into little videos, trying to make it so easy to learn and so easy to dip in and out if there's something that particularly interests you. Then on the other side, we have the modules where we're trying to make the process step by step. We're not claiming we've got there 100% yet, but everyone that goes through this, sometimes they have feedback and we try and tweak it and we're hopefully going to add more videos over time to what we've already got in there. And then there's our private area, the members only forum, which we host on Facebook. It's a closed Facebook group. 
And finally, there's our progress call where we get together every couple of months or so and have a chat about how our projects are going, what we might be struggling with. And just because we're all in the same boat, we can probably help each other. So that's the idea. If you want to find out more information, head to houseplanninghelp.com slash join. I'll give you that again in a second. Let me just remind you what the latest episode of the video is. The roof is going on at Long Barrow Passive House, so you can see that. Then we have a walk around the interior as well, which is fairly much. It's the carcass of a building. And the latest module is on building up your team, how you might do that, what the process might feel like, the people that you'll need, all of that sort of thing. So once again, to get information on pricing and what you get for your membership, houseplanninghelp.com slash join. Just go and take a look. Thank you so much for being there yet again. I always appreciate your company. The House Planning Help podcast is produced by Regen Media, content that matters.